Good morning. It's a little bit past time we start class. We're having a few glitches, uh, technical glitches. Uh, Thomas told me this morning our screen and the uh, back screen is not functioning properly right now, so we're going to have to wing it without that. Uh, let's begin class with prayer. Seems like that has a calming effect on me. I hope it does for you, too. Let's pray. Almighty God, we approach your throne with thanksgiving and with awe of you and all you've done for us, through us, and to us. And dear God, we ask that you continue to hold us in the palm of your hand, deliver us from evil, as your son prayed. Father, we ask that all things be done to your glory and your honor. And as we come together to discuss your word and your power and your eternalness in our class, give us, help us to be mindful of the fact that you are with us constantly and you encourage us, you love us, and you forgive us. And Father, we're so thankful for that forgiveness provided by Jesus on the cross. Be with our shepherds here be with our deacons as they work to shepherd this flock and serve this flock. Be with our members uh, who are either with us by virtual or our members who are here in the class uh, this morning. Help us all to seek to do your will and follow your way. And we pray all these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to see you all this morning, and again, uh, as I acknowledged in prayer for our virtual folks, we're glad you are here. Uh, I, uh, are we good on the uh, second part, Tom? Okay, Thomas, is, he, he, the man's amazing, folks. <laughs> it's a wonder he doesn't smack me, but he's a good, loving brother, so he doesn't do that. But sometimes, you know, some technical difficulties, have you ever seen that go up on your TV screen or something? Uh, you know, if it's electronics, it's challenging, and it's, it's above my pay grade, but Thomas is always able to adjust and adapt and keep us moving forward, and we're thankful for him for that. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, I like to be a little bit spontaneous. You get scripted, it's kind of a, it's, it's like a recording, and I don't want to be that. And you probably never get that from me. You might get shocked or surprised, but you'll never get a, uh, that scripted. Uh, but... Uh, I did have some things cross my mind just actually last night and right before got up this morning. And so I, I want to uh, kind of see how you, I did it a little bit with Judy on the way here, and uh, I, I want to get your reaction and your responses. Uh, what's the first book in the Bible? Genesis? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's a good start. Uh, that was hard. Yeah, that, 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 was the, that, was the, that was the tough one. No, uh, what's the first verse in the Bible? Uh, speak up, folks. First verse in the Bible, they're saying it on virtual right now. Okay, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's correct. I think I heard Vicki or somebody back there saying it. Okay. Now, what did God create? Heaven and earth. No, no, you're getting ahead of yourself. That's what Judy did. She jumped in and said, heaven and earth. What before heaven and earth? No, oh, it's amazing how you're, you're lobbing answers. But Paul has fears no evil. She'll speak up when everybody else will sit there quiet. Keep, keep going, Paul, that you're going to... Uh, well, those are adjectives. Give me a give me a noun. What what did what did God create? Uh, let me ask you something. Then I'll do it indirectly because uh, we, we kind of had a good discussion for the ten minutes we were driving here. What did God create before the beginning? What denotes a beginning? I mean, we're talking time. That's right. Who's, where's, okay, where's Marvin? Was that Mar? oh, 
daddy. That, that's Paulette's daddy. Yeah, he no, said. To, Paulette's daddy. He served for oh, oh, <laughs> wrong, wrong daddy. Yeah, I got it. Okay. All right. Yes, that is correct. It was time. Now, it sounds easy when he said it, but how many of you knew it? Anybody want? God create, in the beginning, God created time. Everything else came after that. Think about that. That's, that's almost, uh, okay, Dennis. Boo, do, I, I'll, I'll repeat it next week. <laughs> if, it's, if I can repeat it, I'll repeat it. Uh, time is something that uh, is so hard to measure because it's God's creation in the beginning. You know, t till then, you stop and think about it, folks. Isn't it ironic today we're on what? Spring forward, fall back. Daylight savings time. One of the dumbest things I ever saw. Why don't they move it forward and leave it alone? But that's my vote. Amen's right, Gentry. But having said that, we are regulated by time. From the very moment God smacked your little bottoms when you were born and you sucked in that air, uh, which started the breath of life that God put in you, uh, when you, st that, that first crying little voice with a midwife or, uh, in my case, doctor, I'm actually named after the doctor that birthed me. Doctor, I'm Glenn Norris, that's Dr. Norris. Well, when Dr. Norris smacked me and I started crying, the, the stopwatch, God's eternal stopwatch started right then. Glenn Shipman is now one of my family, one of my children, literally a child, and all of a sudden, the stopwatch started. And it's still going today, folks. Thank you, Lord. But, you know, I'm 77 years old, and my watch is still running. You're here. Your watch is still running. Some, their watch stopped. Time stopped for them, except for eternal time that God created. Now think about that, folks. That's pretty profound. But if, if I can stumble onto it, you can sure figure it out. That you were a created being, but God had to create time for you to be created being in. Do you grasp that, what we're saying? You know, David David's talked about, you know, I was knit in my mother's womb. Uh, he's saying God starts that process before time we measure it. And so... Uh, our God is an infinite God. He is a God that we cannot fully understand. He says, my ways aren't your ways, and my thoughts aren't your thoughts. Don't be trying to figure me out, because you can't. I know things, I've done things, and I uh, and in control of things. Uh, I find it ironic in today, there's so many unbelievers. There's more unbelievers than our believers, folks. That saddens me, breaks my heart. God's told us that. He said, there, I mentioned that last week. There's a narrow gate and there's a wide gate. And he said, there's going to be more going through that wide gate because it accommodates them. It capitulates to them. It says, come on in. This is easy. What doesn't Satan do? Work that on us. He, he makes it, you got all the time in the world. You're going to live, for, God says, uh, three score and ten by reason of strength, four score. That's 80 years, folks. I'm pushing 80. Some of you are past 80. God's really telling us. He says, that's, that's about all you're going to get. You might live past that, but you, if, it's, if you're strong and healthy. But that's about it. The clock's starting to run out. Well, what's the clock? It's time. We've got a limited amount of time, and God constantly in his scripture is, is telling us the clock started when you were born, and you may need to make the most of the time I've given you while you're here on this earth. Uh, what's, what, what's that telling us? What's that? What's God telling us? Make use of the time for what? What are you going to do with your time? No plans? Oh, I hope you've got plans. I've got plans. I, and I hope you do. Why? Why were you created? Why did God create heaven and earth? Think about it a while. Amen, Dennis. That's cutting to the chase, brother. Uh, we are created to serve God. 
That's the sole purpose. When he breathed the breath of life into Adam and Eve and to all of his creation, we, we should, to me, it's so astounding that there are people on the earth today, on the earth today, living, breathing at the good grace of God, and yet they won't give him one ounce of credit for it or one ounce of acknowledgement. And most assuredly, folks, one ounce of gratitude. That's the sickening and saddening thing about the world today. They're not grateful to a God that created, who started time, who made time reality for us. It's, he's an infinite God. And what's infinite mean? Unending. Thank you, Dennis. Very good. Without limits. He, you know, the more you think about that, the more it humbles you. Uh, our God is a God of Alpha and Omega. That's the Greek word in the New Testament. Alpha and Omega means the beginning and the end. Well, I've always thought that that's a start, that's a stop. That, that's the way it is for Glenn. You know, okay, the stop, you're 77 years, Glenn. Top watch, stop watch is run. It's not that way with God. He is eternal. And for me, he, he compares it. To, what does the Bible say about a man on, on the earth? It's like a what? It's like a vapor. You ever seen that in the morning when the sun comes up and all of a sudden the things heat up? And you'll see that vapors coming up off the grass and off the plants. We're like that. You know, sun comes up here and there and gone. In the, in the infinity of time, and that's what God is infinite. What's that make us, folks? We're using some of these Greek words we've been given. Infinite. God is infinite, so that makes us finite. You might hear that word sometime. You're a finite part of God's creation, with the exception. What's infinite about you? Breath of life. That's eternal soul, folks. You're going to live for an eternity. Your soul, your finite body will decay, and, and the Bible says turn to ashes, turn to dust defines it for us a lot of ways, it will no longer cease to exist as a body. What's going to happen then, folks? You're going to get a new one. Remember Jesus got one when he came back and, and, and saw his apostles and his disciples? You're going to get the same thing. If you don't believe that, uh, Paul said, if, if what we say about God and about his son is not true, what Paul say? We're to be pitied above all people. If, if Christians, we're in here right now taking up pew space, and we're just sitting here and saying, well, uh, here we are again. Uh, it's a nice habit to have. Uh, one, one time I heard Frank Burns on MASH say, it's a great way to kill a Sunday morning. <laughs> well, that's the way a lot of people feel like it. There's no spiritual kinship relationship, an eternal, most assuredly an eternal relationship with God. So as we get back to time and our, what we're going to do in it, uh, one of the things that uh, in our study that I want us to hopefully will understand better uh, is uh, time as it relates to God's time and God's message and God's use of our time for his glory. Uh, I recently uh, was... Um, had a, a, a book I was wanting to use, a Godful, a Gospel Advocate, and uh, I was hoping to use the overheads. Well, as it turns out, this one doesn't work, but this one does. And so uh, I was going to show you something, and I want to discuss with you after we look at this. There's, uh, there's two of them. There's basically an overview of the um, New Testament and the Old Testament, which together is the Bible. Thank you. It's the Bible, and I think we might think we understand it. We're people of the Word, we say. We're in churches of Christ. We're the, we're the people, the studiers of the Word of God, the keeper of faith, the, uh, the knowers of the Word. We can quote it, some of it, and some of us can quote it, some better than others. But the, what's important is, is how do we get that? You know, we say, well, the Bible says it's by inspired man. That's true, but who were they? Do you know? Well, I thought I knew. But uh, this, this little couple of snippets here of the overview of the Bible, we're going to look on our overhead. It's not real lengthy, 
It's only going to take a, a little bit of the class time, uh, but Thomas is going to is going to play this. I'm going to sit down and keep my mouth shut and watch it with the rest of you because every time I see it, I learn something new, uh, and I, I hope you do. And we'll discuss what we see and now what we know or what we think we know and, and just have a good uh, classroom discussion of this uh, s small snippet. Uh, these graphic artists, uh, this is called Bible Project. And I basically was just, again, searching for something that uh, will help me, not you, help me understand God's word better, how we got it. I had too many blank spots in, in my understanding. And this, these little snippets, they're, they're not a cartoon. Every, listen, if you do one thing, do yourself a favor and listen to everything that's said. Uh, you can, if you've got some paper and pencil, write down questions that you have that we can discuss afterwards that they raise. Because uh, I learned so much with this, th just these two. Uh, one was an overview of the Old Testament, an overview of the New Testament, the overview of the Bible, because that is the Bible. And it explains how we got some things and how some things we didn't get. But it, remember all this that they're discussing with you is the inspired word of God and something I had conversation with one of the, their staff. It's their research staff and everything. And he says, well, what we are seeking to do, because he said it's all about Jesus Christ. He said, uh, we are evangelical uh, nonprofit group and we are raising awareness of people of this is your heritage this is your spiritual heritage how'd you get it and how'd it come about and how, uh, what's the bible written in here's a basic thing what's the bible written in uh, beg hebrew and greek originally hebrew and greek uh, who were the greeks us who were the hebrews the jews they got it first and then we got it and God's was over all and in all and through all. That's the beautiful thing about God. He uses his creation for his good purposes if his creation is willing and able to do so. And we are folks, so we need to know what the drill is. And so we're going to watch this. Uh, are we ready to go, Thomas? Okay, got a thumbs up. All right, well, let's watch this. And this be right down if there's a question you have or write down something that stuck out in your mind. It did me. I'll tell you after we watch this that I thought I was just gobstruck. I said, I didn't know that. That's the, the, the Jew, Hebrews. That was what they were supposed to do. Yeah. And so uh, I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. And we'll discuss it after uh, it's complete. Is that will that be the whole block, Thomas? OK, very good. If you open a Protestant Christian Bible and look at the table of contents, you'll notice the first three quarters is a collection called the Old Testament. If you look at the list of books, you'll see it's made up of 39 smaller works that are grouped into four main sections. The first five are called the Pentateuch, followed by the historical books, then the poetic books, and finally the books of the prophets. Now that seems simple enough, but actually it's more complicated and way more interesting. This arrangement of the books in a single volume called the Old Testament is a later Christian tradition that developed after Jesus and the Apostles. In ancient Jewish tradition, these works were all on separate scrolls and were conceived of as a unified three-part collection called Tanakh. It's a Hebrew acronym for Torah, which means instruction, Nevi'im, which means prophets, and Ketuvim, which means writings. The Tanakh has the same books as the Protestant Old Testament, but they're arranged differently. The Torah corresponds to the Pentateuch, but the prophets consist of four historical narrative books and then the 15 works named after specific prophets. After this comes the writings, a diverse collection of poetic and narrative texts. Now this three-part design is really, really old. It's referred to in ancient Jewish texts like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Wisdom of Ben Sira, even Jesus of Nazareth mentioned it. And that's because this three-part shape is woven into the compositional design of the scrolls themselves. If you pay attention, you'll discover that every scroll has been coordinated by means of cross-references that link each work into the larger three-part collection. So who put all these scrolls together? It was a long process. Some of the famous contributors are named, like Moses or David. 
but most of the authors remain anonymous. In the Bible, they're simply called scribes or the prophets. These scrolls took shape throughout Israel's history as generations of prophetic scribes collected earlier stories and poems, integrated them into larger compositions, and then eventually shaped all this material into the unified library of scrolls, the Tanakh. It's clear from texts in the Psalms and Prophets that these prophetic scribes believed that God's Spirit was guiding this whole process so that through these human words, God speaks to his people. That's why they treasured these texts, studying and composing them into a unified collection. We don't know when precisely this process was finished, but it was somewhere in the last centuries before the time of Jesus. In its final shape, the Tanakh offers a prophetic interpretation of Israel's history that claims to reveal God's purposes to rescue the whole world. And while we can't do justice to the whole collection in one video, it's helpful to get an overview of what these scrolls are all about. The Torah begins with God creating and blessing a great piece of real estate, our very good world. And God entrusts it to a creature that reflects the divine image. Human, or in Hebrew, Adam. God appoints humanity to rule the world as kings and queens of creation. And the question is whether they will trust God's wisdom to discern good and evil or seize autonomy and define good and evil for themselves. But there's another creature with the humans, a mysterious snake. It's in rebellion against the creator and it dupes the humans to foolishly rebel against God's generosity. As a result, humanity is separated from its divine source of life and exiled from a garden of blessing to die in a dangerous wilderness. From there, humanity keeps spreading and redefining good and evil, and things go downhill fast. They build cities plagued by violence and oppression, all leading to the foundation of a city called Babylon, where people exalt themselves to the place of God. And now the basic plot conflict of the whole Bible is set. God wants to bless his world and rule it through humans. But now, humans are the problem. They're under the influence of evil, they're stupid and short-sighted, and headed for self-destruction. And this is all a setup for God's solution. We need a new kind of human. And so God promises that a new human will come, who won't give in to the snake. In fact, he'll crush it and be crushed by it. From here, the story traces the promised lineage to a man and a woman, Abraham and Sarah. God entrusts them with the same divine blessing given to humanity on page one. And so they leave Babylon to a new garden-like land that God promises to give his family. What follows is the story of Abraham's family. Three generations, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, followed by 12 sons. And our hopes are high until we read their very dysfunctional and destructive family story. They lie, cheat, nearly kill each other, not to mention the sex scandals. But what did you expect after the garden story? They're humans. Eventually, Abraham's family ends up exiled down in Egypt. All these failures of Abraham's family form a dark background for the handful of bright moments in the story. God stays committed to these people. He even makes them an eternal promise called a covenant that he will rescue and bless all humanity through them. How exactly? Isn't clear. But Abraham's family is at its best when they stop their selfish scheming and trust God's promise with radical faith. From here, the family grows. They end up enslaved in Egypt and were introduced to the Torah's other main character, Moses. God raises him up to rescue the Israelites and bring them to a mountain where they're all invited into a covenant relationship with God. They're given 613 terms of the relationship, guidelines for becoming new kinds of humans who will faithfully represent God to the world. And Moses brokers this whole deal because He's awesome. He's the ultimate prophet who speaks God's word to Israel. He's a priest who represents them before God. And he's even called a king, Israel's leader and deliverer in time of need. But as the Torah progresses, the Israelites fail big time. They violate the covenant and even Moses rebels against God. In fact, the Torah ends with Moses predicting that Israel's failure will continue as they go back into the promised land and they're going to end up in exile once again. But he has hope that God will fulfill his promise to rescue Israel. One day he will cover for their failures. He'll heal their selfish hearts so they can truly love God and live. And then Moses dies. Now, the final sentences of the Torah scroll are surprising. They zoom forward in time. And we hear from the prophetic scribes who shaped the Tanakh. 
They reflect back on the story of Moses from their vantage point, and they tell us that never again in Israel's history did a prophet like Moses arise. Man, I wish another prophet, priest, king like him would come along. And with that, we move into the Nevi'im. It has two sub-collections. First, the former prophets, four narrative works about Israel's story in the Promised Land, told from the later perspective of the prophets. Things start great with Joshua's leadership. We're told he's successful because he's just like Moses, and he meditates on Scripture day and night. But eventually, even Joshua fails, beginning Israel's long and violent descent into self-destruction, just like Moses and the Garden story anticipated. These stories mostly focus on the failure of Israel's kings, prophets, and priests, how they lie, cheat, and kill each other, and worship idols. It's basically a longer, bloodier replay of the ancestors' failures. But there are some bright spots. God reaffirms his covenant promise to bless humanity through a new human. It will be a king from the line of David. And you get some stories about people like David or Solomon who have moments like Abraham when they trust God, but it never lasts. And wouldn't you know it, the family of Abraham ends up right where they began, conquered and exiled in Babylon. But remember, this whole story is being told from the later perspective of the prophets, and they know exile isn't the end. So they design these stories of Israel's past as pointers to their future hope. When God does rescue his people out of Babylon, he'll send that new king who will be like Moses and David and Solomon were on their good days. In fact, this is what the second part of the Nevi'im, the latter prophets, is all about. There are three large and twelve short works connected to specific prophets, and this design intentionally recalls the three plus twelve ancestors from Genesis whose stories of failure contained the seeds of future hope. These prophetic scrolls are loaded with cross-references that link back into the narrative of the Torah and the prophets, and they carry the story further. The job of Israel's prophets was to be like Moses, to accuse the old Israel of failure and corruption, and to warn them about the looming result, the great day of the Lord, which ended with defeat and exile in Babylon. But the prophets also promised that God had a purpose, to purify his people and recreate a new Israel who would be faithful like Abraham was. They'll live in a new covenant relationship with God under the reign of that promised ruler, who's described as a new Moses, but called by the name David. He will be the one to restore God's blessing to the entire world. The conclusion of the Nevi'im is just like the Torah. There's a note from the Tanakh's prophetic scribes. They reflect back over the whole story so far, and they urge readers to anticipate the arrival of a new Moses-like prophet, who they call Elijah. He will announce the arrival of Israel's God to purify and save his people. From here, we move into the Tanakh's third and final sub-collection, the Ketuvim, a diverse collection of scrolls. Each one has been designed to link back into the key themes from the Torah and the prophets and develop them further through an elaborate tapestry of cross-references. For example, the Psalms scroll is introduced by two poems that are coordinated to the beginning of the Torah and the prophets. In the first psalm, we meet the righteous one, who's described as a new Joshua, a successful leader who meditates on the scriptures. He's like the king promised by Moses, and he's like the eternal tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Psalm 2 then identifies this figure. It's the promised king, the son of God from the line of David, who's going to defeat evil among the nations and restore God's blessing to the world. And the rest of the psalm scroll teaches God's people how to pray as they wait for this future hope. Then there are the wisdom scrolls that address some of the most difficult questions raised by the story of the Torah and the prophets. So Proverbs sounds like Moses in the Torah. Trust in God, be faithful and obedient, and you'll have peace and success. But then Ecclesiastes and Job reflect back on Israel's complicated history and say, yeah, we tried that, and it's not that simple. These three books carry on a profound conversation about what it means to live wisely in God's good and often confusing world. Two of the last books of the Tanakh to be written make a crucial contribution. The Daniel scroll looks back over the long history of Israel's failure and suffering as a strange door of hope into a new future for the world. One day, that new human promised in the Torah and prophets will arrive— He's going to be trampled by humanity's animal-like inclinations towards evil, but then God will vindicate him and raise him up to rule the world in divine power. 
And finally, the Scroll of Chronicles retells the entire story of the Tanakh from the beginning up to Israel's return from exile. The author focuses on God's promise to David of a future king who will reunite God's people in a new Jerusalem and bring divine blessing to the nations. The final lines of the Chronicles scroll have been coordinated with key texts from all over the Tanakh. They keep alive the hope of an ultimate return from exile, pointing to the arrival of an Israelite whose God is with him, that he may go up and restore the new Jerusalem. And that's how the story ends. The Tanakh is a majestically and intentionally designed collection of ancient Hebrew scrolls. These diverse texts from all periods of Israel's history have been woven together as a unified story about God's covenant promise to Israel and to all humanity. They were made for a lifetime's worth of reading and reflection, as these remarkable human words offer a divine word of wisdom and future hope that still speaks today. Did you find that interesting? I learned more in that little 12 minute uh, overview of the Old Testament. Things I thought I knew I didn't know and things I I didn't know I'm glad I know now. Uh, Next week we will discuss uh, the New Testament and receive an overview of it and discuss it. Uh, Is there anything in this that stuck out in your minds, any scriptures, anything, anything worth taking a note about or that you have a question about? We're just about out of time, so. As a teacher once said, well, folks, is it clear as mud or crystal clear? <laughs> That's an awful lot of stuff to take in in a very condensed p- period of time. Yes, Howard. Absolutely. Well, the Bible says it's a schoolmaster. The Old Testament is a schoolmaster to help us know and know how it's connected. I think these folks do an excellent job of connecting the dots between that. And one of the things that can, uh, that really I enjoyed and, and saw, that I got it, was the fact that all of this was at God's hand. These guys were just rambling along. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and directed by God's own hand. This is what I want you to write. The fact that he used men, scribes, and others to record that, it was still the Word of God, uh, the incarnate Word of God. It was, it's God's hand in it all. and. You know, after looking at that little snippet, I thought, wow, what a pattern. Who else could be capable of doing that through generations, through thousands of years, and bringing this up to the point where basically all of this is pointing to that, and what's that? What's that? Jesus Christ and him crucified. How's God's plan? Where's God's plan? They wondered themselves. They weren't sure of it, but they knew one thing of God was directing them in the right directions. Where did they mess up? It's talked about, you know, it talked about uh, God. God would get them out of one fix and they'd go right into another. Uh, isn't that typical of us sometimes? Isn't that typical right now of our country? We're in a mess, folks. It's about time somebody steps up and just says, things aren't going well right now. Everything from COVID to you name it. And I'm not gonna I'm not on a political bent. I'm just telling you, it's here, it's it's with us, we're dealing with it, or we don't deal with it. How do you deal with chaos in your lifetime and how did they deal with chaos in their lifetime? Pray, Pray call on the name of the Lord. That's right. Uh You better be praying, folks, because God says, if you don't pray to me, if you don't ask my help, if you think you've got a better way, if you think you've chosen a better way, then go ahead and try it. There's consequences with that, and there's consequences with turning your back on me, and there's consequences with you not thinking about me every day of your life. Uh, And so I I challenge you to be thinking about that. Uh, I hope you're interested and want to 
see the overview of the New Testament because there's the payoff. Uh, to me, when, when I saw that, I thought, there's where all the pointing, there's where all the praying, there's where all the righteousness lies. Not in all these Hebrews that made mistakes, messed up. I'm, I'm thankful that God had the honesty to show us how they really were. You know, the, the writer here, he said, I mean, the Jews were a mess. Everything went, after Adam and Eve, everything went wrong. Brothers killing brothers, uh, incest, uh, you name it. Uh, they, they were a mess. And, and you know, the, the question keeps occurring in my mind, okay, if they are a mess, and sometimes I see what's going on in our society today, we're in a mess, folks. And so uh, who's going to deliver us? The same person that was prophesied and alluded to in the Old Testament. It's pointing the way to Jesus. And so I hope you look forward to next week when we get an overview of the New Testament and how God in his infinite wisdom ties it all together in this beautiful uh, book called the Bible. We should thank God every day of the week for the Bible and what's available to us in it and use it. It is, it's not just a helpful guide. It's just not your manufacturer's handbook. It's your path, guided path. It's your due north compass to eternal life. And if you don't embrace it, if you don't seek it in your life, you'll lose your way. I can guarantee it. That's the result uh, of not following God's word. Uh, I think we're past time. Uh, how many minutes we got left? How many minutes we have left? Two minutes, okay. Well, we, I can hear the rustling of little feet out in the foyer, so uh, I'll leave that with you. Uh, did anybody take any notes? Okay. Torah. Same way with me. Uh, Shema, all these Hebrew words, you know, uh, they, didn't, they didn't do Greek back then, not, not the populace. And most of the populace were not, were illiterate. A lot of them couldn't read and write. So you had to have the scribes and those literate men that could pass that on. God didn't put those tablets on a stone for Moses for no reason at all. They had to have somebody tell them what that meant, what God told them to do and not to do. So let's, let's think about these things and pray about these things. And I hope to see you again next week uh, along with our visual folks on, on television. And we will explore the overview of the New Testament. Uh, I found it is, uh, is exciting because it's, it's the culmination of what we've been waiting for, what God's creation was waiting for. So uh, I enjoyed the time we spent with you. Thank you.